when we talk about Catholics and politics, or when we talk about politics in general, as Catholics, we have to step back for a moment and think of things differently than the secular world. And the first thing that we have to think in terms of is that there is always a spiritual war going on. And that spiritual war is a very big battlefield. And there are different foxholes or battles going on on that great, big, huge battlefield. One of those foxholes is the world of politics. And for us to not keep that uppermost in our minds begins to make us quiver, shake in our faith. At the end of the day, the only thing that matters is the salvation of souls. That's it. Now, the battle for souls goes on in a million different ways in a million different types of environments and circumstances, one of those is politics. And as we talk about politics specifically, we have to view it in terms of a battle between good and evil. And that doesn't mean that you know, one party is good and the other is evil necessarily. Lots of times in politics, we get a mixed bag. Mostly good, a little bad, mostly bad, some good. It's kind of all jumbled up. But there's one area in the world of politics where it is either evil or good. And that area is when we talk about things that are intrinsically evil. Abortion, same-sex marriage, euthanasia, those kinds of topics. There is no halfway with those kinds of topics. There is no partly, there is no... 90% okay, but 10% holding back? No. If something is intrinsically evil, it must be 100% resisted. Now, laws don't come out of the blue. Laws are proposed by lawmakers. That's why we call them lawmakers, because they make the law. So laws don't drop out of the sky, they come out of the minds and hearts of the lawmakers. And if a lawmaker wants to make a law that is intrinsically evil, not only must the law be resisted, but so must the lawmaker. You can't leave somebody around in office who scatters poison around sometimes because you never know when he's going to scatter poison so he has to go or she has to go if they're in office you must work diligently to get them out of office if they are trying to get into office and you know that they support intrinsic evils because they say so in their speeches and their newspaper articles and that sort of thing you have to make sure they don't get into office. You have to work against them getting into office. If there is a bad law on the books, RH, you must do whatever you can do to get that law taken off the books. And in order to do that, you have two avenues. Either get the people who voted for it to change their minds, that almost never happens, or you change the person with somebody else. It is your duty as Catholics to 
be involved in this kind of work. You don't get to sit back and say, oh, well, boy, that's really a shame that they've allowed contraception. Boy, oh, boy, that's awful. The world's going to hell. Uh, that's awful. Anyway, back to whatever I'm doing. Catholics have a responsibility to love God with all our hearts, minds, soul, and strength. That's the first commandment. And since we are faithful, obedient Catholics, we follow the commandments. God does not want men killing children. God does not want couples, married or not, using contraception. And Catholics are about bringing about, trying to bring about the will of God, the absolute most efficient way they can do that. Now, politics is an interesting thing because what is politics? Politics is the process of laws coming into effect and those laws being executed and carried out in the day-to-day -day life. But politics is also an expression of what the culture already believes and accepts. Or, in the case of people who don't really understand what a law was, they didn't care enough to find out. So they're indifferent. And indifferent people are usually harder to battle with than people who are actually opposed to you. At least the people opposed to you will sit and fight and argue with you. The people who are indifferent don't care. They walk away and they don't, they're just not plugged in at all. But remember that. Politics is the expression. When a law gets passed in a democracy, it expresses the will of the people. So what I'm proposing to you is that politics, yes, but not just. You will be forever frustrated if you are trying to change a culture by continually changing the laws. You must work to change laws, absolutely. But that's not the only way to change a culture. And ultimately, it is not the best way to change a culture. When an evil law is passed like RH, okay, you have to spring into action immediately and get working to overturn it. But the culture, through its lawmakers, has already accepted it. So you're, the idea behind it, or at least hasn't opposed it enough because they didn't care. We have this exact same thing in the United States. 50% of Catholics voted for Obama. 50% voted for Obama. 47% did not. They voted for, um, what's his name? Mitt Romney. And the other 3% voted for, you know, a couple different candidates that nobody cared about or knew about. But you can sit and argue during a campaign season all you want. It's during the off times that you've got to really work hard. And the only way you can really ensure that laws that come out of politics are good and moral is to make sure that the people who are being elected is good and moral. And the way you do that is to make sure that the electorate, the people doing the voting, are good and moral. And that's where the real hard work comes in. You know, elections come and go. They happen every two years, every four years, whatever it is. And then they're gone. And when the election's over, people sit back and go, ah, oh, we won, or ah, oh, we lost, and that's it. They don't really get involved again anymore until you get gearing up for the next election. If you're a Catholic and you get stuck in that 
circle, you're going to lose every time. You've got to be working every day at changing the culture. And that doesn't mean just handing out flyers for candidates and trying to get this law passed and this law repealed. It means something much deeper than that. Why in the Philippines do you have RH right now? Let's go backwards, keep going backwards and ask the question. Why do you have RH? Why is contraception legal in the Philippines right now? Because enough Congress people voted for it. Why did enough Congress people vote for it? Well, some of them were bribed, others were intimidated, others were too cowardly to oppose it for whatever reason. But at the end of the day, when the vote was taken, more voted for it than voted for against it, voted against it. Why? Well, clearly the 133 who voted for it don't expect to pay any political price for it. They don't expect that they're going to get voted out of office because they voted for it. Remember, every time a politician casts a vote for something, the only thing he or she cares about, almost always, is whether this vote is going to cost them their job the next time around. They care about themselves. That's it. So they cast their vote based on what they think, and they're generally right, they cast their vote based on what they think the voters who they represent will do to them. Will they vote for them or will they not? And that's how it works. They're pretty secure when they cast a vote for something bad that they're not going to have to pay a price for it. Why? Because they know that the people who vote for them agree with that position. And that's where the work of the Catholic Church has to come in and has to be a very solid everyday effort. Every day. If you have an evil president, and you do, you have an evil president because enough people support his evil. He didn't get into office by walking up with a gun and shooting everybody. He got voted in. Evil laws get passed because evil lawmakers pass them. And evil lawmakers stay in power because evil voters keep them in power. At the end of the day, whether it's the Philippines or the United States or France or England or Ireland or wherever it is, it doesn't matter. If people are voting in evil, it's because they love evil. Well, what does that say for the church? It says we are failing as a church. If we are letting evil take charge of a culture, of a society, of a nation. Remember, those laws that get passed are just the tip of the iceberg. They're what bubble up from underneath, and at the end of the day, ding, here's the law. The law does not drop out of the sky. It gets promoted and advanced and campaigned and you know, advertised on TV and radio and newspapers. And da, da, da. So what you've got to look at really to say how do we change this for good, not just this election or the next election. How do you change an immoral political system into moral by making sure that the people become moral. And if they have become immoral, well, that becomes an even harder job. When you look around at the failing of a culture in a country that has a very strong Catholic presence in it, even America is 25% Catholic. 
One out of every four Americans is a baptized Catholic. That's pretty amazing for a Protestant country. One out of four. And with even that big number, America is going down the toilet. We kill 4,000 children a day through abortion. 4,000 a day, every day, 365 days a year, we kill 4,000 of our own citizens every day. And why? Because people want to have sex with no consequences. That's it. It's not because of rape and incest and this. People want to have sex and they don't want to have to pay the consequences or deal with the price of that. They're not moral. They vote in Obama, the abortion and chief commander, who wants to not only let people kill babies, but he wants to take money from taxpayers and give it to the people who do the killing. Not only does he want to do it, he does do it. So this means that the church in America, the Catholic Church, has failed. It has not been the light to the nations that it should be. It has taken its light and stuck it under a bushel basket. And why is that? Because inside the church, there are too many Judas Iscariots. There are too many traitors to Christ inside the church. Many of them are in powerful positions. Many of them are in influential positions. They confuse young minds in universities. They write books. They publish articles. They put on conferences. They appear on radio. They appear on TV. Some of them have Roman collars on. They sound like priests because they are priests. Just like Judas Iscariot was. And they have betrayed the faith. And why? Have they betrayed the faith? Because they don't accept the truth of Christ the way Christ said it. They want to change what Christ said. They make a living doing this. They live like leeches on the church, like parasites living in the church's institutions, its universities, its rectories, its chanceries, its seminaries. They're not men. They're cowards. They won't go out into the world and try to change the church from the outside. So they stay inside the church, trying to corrupt her from inside. They appear in newspapers, giving interviews. They have blogs where they say the church is wrong on this and wrong on that. Their stuff gets spread far and wide by a secular media that hates the church and is all too willing to pick up their treason and spread it everywhere they can to make it sound like these are viable Catholic positions. This is life in the church in the United States. Every day. On Sundays, priests got up in their pulpits before the election and threw all their support behind Obama. In Mass, in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, they stood up and supported a child killer. Hundreds of them. Hundreds of them. 
Now, America has a different scene in the church than you do here in the Philippines. The church in America is, again, only 25% of the population, although most don't go to church. 75% to 80% of Catholics in America don't go to church on Sunday. Most American Catholics you will only find in church at a wedding or a funeral. I have, a, I have a feeling that might be the case here as well sometimes. But the difference is that America, the Catholics, again, are only 25%. Only one out of four. But here in the Philippines, Catholics are well over three out of four. Four out of five. Imagine if you could fix the problems in the church in the Philippines you would fix the Philippines. If we fixed the problems in the church in America, we might or might not fix America just because we're only 25% of the population. But we have traitors in the government, in politics, Catholic traitors all over the government. Most Catholics in Washington, D.C., who are politicians, most are traitors to the faith. Most of them support abortion. Almost all of them support contraception. A big majority of them support same-sex marriage. About half of them support human cloning and stem cell research, human embryonic stem cell research. What has happened to the church in America? You must be careful that the same thing does not happen to the church here. And if you detect that it has happened or is happening, this is where your battle is. You fix the church in the Philippines and you fix the politics in the Philippines. And how does one fix the church? Well, what is the goal of the church? What is the work of the church? It's to make saints. That's it. It's the only reason the church exists. The church doesn't exist to be uh, a social help agency. It doesn't exist to run governments. It doesn't exist to pave the roads or make sure that the jeepneys don't smash into each other. I don't know how they don't smash into each other, actually. They're driving all over the place. The church exists to make saints. That's it. That's the only thing. And imagine if the church was successful in that job. Well, if the church was making saints, pouring out saints like Detroit pours out cars, you wouldn't have to worry about any of this. We wouldn't even be here. What would we be, what would we be sitting here talking about? Have a nice little meal, visit with everybody, and go home. You wouldn't have to fly Americans 37 hours across the Pacific Ocean. The point of the church is to make saints. That's it. That's it. So while what I'm telling you is you have a two-front war, and the one front is the politics, and that's very immediate because it's right in your face. You know, RH just passed, you've got new elections coming up, you know, all those things. It's right here, it's right immediate. And because it's immediate and the one you're staring at, it's the one that gets all the attention. But the real war is the war inside the church. When Jesuit priests 
publish blogs. And then those blogs get essentially cut and pasted and stuck on the front page of newspapers. And those blogs say, Ah, oh, yeah, we've heard enough from you bishops about R.H. Shut up, you sound like a broken record. Well, Catholics need to go on that blog and leave about 645,000 comments and say, you shut up, Father. How can you call yourself a priest, Father? You support the destruction of human life, Father. Your voice as Catholic lay people and religious must be raised every single time you see an attack on virtue. Every time. Every time. Because the diabolical attacks virtue every time it can you must hit back every time. Every time. Do you think Satan goes to bed and leaves his work to somebody else? Do you think hell takes a vacation? Oh, summer's coming up. Let's go on a three-week vacation. The diabolical never rests. The diabolical never rests because it knows that it loses this war. The war is already lost. It knows that. But the playing out of the battles, it knows one day those battles come to an end. So it fights more ferociously than most good people. And that is simply not an option. That is not an option for faithful Catholics who know the truth. And so when I say every time, what do I mean every time? I mean if you read something in a newspaper or something on the blog or in the internet, you respond to it. And you say, that's not in keeping with Catholic teaching. And I don't care if you're a priest or not. You're wrong. You, Father, are not the church, nor is it your church, and I don't care how many degrees you have behind your name, Father. Judas was no dummy. He was the guy in charge of the money because he was probably the smartest. So much for all his brains, right? But... This is also in your private lives. If the church is failing in the Philippines, which if I look at RH, I'm visiting, if I look at RH and I go, hmm, that's curious. How did Catholic Philippines that used to stop in the middle of the day to say the Angelus on the radio and in schools and in the Congress and in street corners and intersections and TV, everything, how did Catholic Philippines ever get to this law being on the books? Well, I don't live here, but I can look and take a pretty darn good guess. It means the church is failing in what it needs to do. And that doesn't mean, oh, it's those bishops' fault, so I've got to go back to work. Maybe the bishops could do better. Maybe they couldn't. But it does mean that when somebody in my family sits around at a family event and says, oh, the church is wrong about this, or I disagree with that teaching, and you don't say anything, you're responsible. Every single Catholic has an obligation every time the church is attacked to stand up and defend the church. Defend the church's teachings. Why? Because the church is Jesus Christ here on earth. 
This isn't a list of things like we're in some social club and here's our 15 rules and it's okay if you agree with 13 of them and disagree with the other two. Well, you agree with the majority of them, so that's okay. We'll let you stay in the club. This isn't a club. It's the mystical body of Christ here on earth. Protected by the Holy Spirit. You can't disagree with any teaching of the church at all, ever, and call yourself a faithful Catholic. Period. Exactly which part of the gospel do you reject? I accept all three of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and most of John, but boy, chapters 5, 6, 7, and 8, eh, not so sure about those, but the rest of it's okay. Don't call yourself a Catholic. You're a bad Catholic. You're an unfaithful Catholic. Judas believed most of what Jesus said, just not all of it. And in the end, he betrayed him. The Catholic Church, the Catholic teachings are an all or nothing proposition. They always have been. Because at the end of the day, the Catholic Church is about love. It's about love. And there's no such thing as 95% love. How many of you here are married? Are you okay with your spouses loving you just 90%? Even though it might feel like that some days. Love doesn't admit of 90% or 50%. Or even 99%. Love is total or it's not love. Living in the church is total or it's not living in the church. It's living like you live in the church, but at the end of the day, you don't. And if you don't live in the church, you can never be a saint. No one gets to be a saint by living out three out of every four commands and ignoring the other one. We call those folks cafeteria Catholics. And you will never be able to effectively change politics for the long haul as long as you have people who vote the majority of the electorate is not living a life of virtue. It won't work. Because even if you're successful in this election, well, guess what? Satan always has another election until the end of the world or the end of your nation. Even if, now remember, we had Bill Clinton for two terms in the 90s, elected in 92, then elected in 96, till 2000. And then when George Bush got elected, George Bush W got elected, people were like, well, at least the guy who cheats on his wife isn't in office anymore. Whatever you think about George Bush, he didn't cheat on his wife, he wasn't an adulterer, he didn't support child murder. Whatever you think about him, about the Iraq war or something. Personally, he didn't squirrel away with interns. And he didn't support child murder. Ah, but Satan knew. Well, didn't quite get a really horrible, mean guy in that time. But you know what? There's another election in 2008. And I'll get him in. And make no mistake, Barack Obama is in power in the United States because Satan engineered that election. Absolutely. Whenever somebody evil and diabolical is at the head of a government, it's because the 
evil and diabolical one runs the show. Period. And our faith tells us this. Our faith tells us this. Nobody should be shocked by these statements. The man supports pulling children apart in the womb and cleaning them out with a vacuum cleaner, cutting them up to pieces. How can he be anything but evil? And then he takes other people's money and wants to pay for it with it. How can it be anything but evil? And just before the election, he came out and said that two men having sex with each other should be allowed to be called marriage. He's evil. And people who support these things are evil. Let's call a spade a spade here. Evil is evil. But there's this great reluctance in society and culture to talk in these terms. Oh, you can't say somebody's evil. It'll hurt their feelings. Too bad. You say what needs to be said the way it needs to be said so that everybody is very clear when you walk away from the microphone exactly what you meant. Every one of you has a microphone with some people, friends in school, family, people you work with, political leaders, whoever it is. How can any of us think that one day we're going to be standing before the throne of our Lord when we die and we're going to have to explain how when he was attacked, however he was attacked, by politicians or editorials or friends or family members or whatever, and we just sat there and said nothing. Cowards. Cowards. Cowards do not get into heaven. They don't get into heaven. Go look in the book of Revelation and, and read the list of the people who were damned. And the very first crowd mentioned are cowards. The first among the damned are the cowards, the chickens, the frady cats, the people who don't want to say the truth because they're afraid of the consequences of the truth. If you will not live in the truth in this life, do not ever hope to try to live it in the next. It will be denied you because you accepted living a lie. So, you get to live apart from the truth for all eternity. This is just the faith simply expressed. The church did not convert the Roman Empire because there were cowards leading the way. The church did not invent and build up and create Christendom for a thousand years because the people who headed the monasteries and the religious orders and the popes and all of that were cowards. They were great saints. They were saints who turned civilizations around by their sacrifices. Have any of you here heard of Bishop Sheen, Fulton Sheen? When I was 14 years old, I got to serve Mass for Bishop Sheen. We were living in San Francisco. It was July 4th, 1976, America's 200th Bicentennial. And he came to give the homily at the Mass that day, and I was one of the altar boys. And after the Mass, we were all in the back in the sacristy, and he was talking to all of us, and this one fellow kind of a hippie type fellow came walking in from the other side and he had a book with him. It was a big sacristy. It was probably about the size of this room. And we were all over there in that corner and he came walking in from over here and he walked pretty quickly and he was waving this book around and he yelled to Bishop Sheen. He said, Bishop Sheen, Bishop Sheen, I've just come back from the Far East and I've written this book. And it, I put together the best of Catholicism and the best of Eastern mysticism. 
And Bishop Sheen, he was three years before he died, he was 76 years old, wheeled around and yelled at the guy. He goes, get out! Get out! The Catholic faith is a gift from Almighty God. I will not have you polluting it. Get out! There's somebody who loves Jesus Christ. And his first concern was not, I wonder if I'll hurt his feelings. His first concern was not, well, if I say something, they won't like me. He was burning with his love for the truth, and he was not about to let someone pollute it. That's why today he is venerable Bishop Sheen on his way to sainthood because heroes go to heaven and cowards go to hell. <laughs> My dear brothers and sisters in the faith, it doesn't matter that I'm American, it doesn't matter that you're Filipino, what matters is that we're Catholic. What matters at the end of the day is that the church prevails, period, period. Now the church at the end of the world will prevail. We have that promise from the mouth of our blessed Lord himself, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. But we have no idea what that means on a local church by church basis anywhere around the world. We don't know that, that that wasn't a promise given to the church in the Philippines. That wasn't a promise given to the church in America. When you read through the book of Revelation, the first couple of chapters, there's seven churches there in Asia Minor that our Lord himself comes to and talks to. And he refers to the, his, their, the presence of their faith as a candlestick. And he says, I will take the candlestick away. You know, and he says to each church, you know, you're doing well, you need to do better. You're doing horrible, pick yourself up. And, you know, and he goes on like that and gives them kind of like a little report card. Every one of those churches eventually died. Every one of them. None of them are there anymore. You have no guarantee that won't happen to the church in the Philippines. I have no guarantee it won't happen to the church in America. Look all over Europe. There's barely anything of the church left. Almost nothing of the church left. We go to Rome quite a bit with our travels. And I'm struck that just about, with the exception of St. Peter's, the back altar where the big window of the Holy Spirit is, the altar of the chair, with the exception of that specific place when mass is being offered I'm struck by how empty the churches are in Rome for mass almost no one there in Rome somebody did a survey six months ago on France the faith in France and they said how many people what percentage of Catholics go to mass based on their age. And they did a, you know, over 80, over 70, over 60. And when they got down to 18 to 25, so few French Catholics between 18 and 25 go to Mass every Sunday that in the box they put 0%. Our Lord never promised the church in France would survive. So we can't think of this as a, oh, well, we're Catholic. Oh, yeah, no, 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 no. The church is the church because our Lord instructs us to teach the faith, to save our souls and as many souls as we can. And at the end of the day, that is the only battle that matters. 
I'll share a story with you. At We were at the March for Life in Washington, D.C. Uh, two weeks ago. Two, two, yeah, two weeks ago. By the way, 650,000 people showed up for that march. 650,000, two-thirds of a million Americans went into Washington, D.C. on, believe me, what was one of the coldest days I've ever felt in my life and marched from the Washington Mall straight up Constitution Avenue to the Supreme Court and nobody in the secular media covered the event. They said nothing about it. The big paper for Washington, Washington DC, the Washington Post, it never happened, never happened. If you flip through the pages of the Washington Post for that day or the next day, it didn't happen. That's the largest march in Washington, D.C. every year, and this year was the largest one in the history of the march. Never happened. But the next, that was on Friday, the next day on Saturday, 2,000, two, two little thousand, 650,000, 2,000. 2,000 people marched the same route about gun control. Front page, front page. Thousands gather for gun control. Yeah, two. Just to let you know how the secular media is in the United States. At the end of the day, what matters is that you are concerned with saving souls. The night before the march, yeah, the night before the march, I was sitting in a, a restaurant with some people, and one of the people that was visiting with us uh, was a person who's very, very, very involved in the pro-life movement, very involved. I'll keep the name private because the person's well known. Very involved, very committed, every day, right there, fighting away. But this person isn't Catholic. This person is a Protestant. Sitting beside me was a guy who is very Catholic wasn't a priest, he's a layman, very Catholic, and he got into a discussion with this person. And the person said that they had read Pope Paul's encyclical Humanae Vitae and said, wow, that's really a powerful document and everything that the Pope said in that is true and it's all come to pass. And so the discussion went on for a little bit and this fellow didn't realize that this one wasn't Catholic until this one said so. And he went, whoa, wait a minute, you're not Catholic? Wait, so you're Protestant and you've read Humanae Vitae and you think it's brilliant and yet you're not Catholic. And they said back, yeah, yeah, I don't want to talk about that. I don't want to talk about that at all. I just want to talk about the things we agree on. So the guy said to this one, well, is that the argument that you would take from somebody who was pro-abortion? Would you say, well, all, you know, you're just fine talking to them about the things you agree on? And again, the person goes, look, I said, I don't want to talk about this. Don't try to convert me. I don't want to talk about that. I just want to talk about the pro-life stuff. And his answer or his response Listen to the brilliance of this. He said, what good does it do you if you save all kinds of babies, but you lose your soul? That's a pretty smack across the face. Well, as you might imagine, the person was like, what? And the person said, I don't want to talk about this anymore. And this guy says, well, I do. 
because your soul is more important to me than saving babies. And this person said, well, that's it. I don't want to. Got up, slammed the chair under the table, and walked away. What would you have done in that situation? You don't have to answer. Think about it. What would you have done in that situation? Your first duty to every single person around you, including yourself, is your Catholic faith. If everybody in the world was a faithful Catholic, I wouldn't be here and neither would you. Make saints and you don't have to worry about the politics. But you don't make saints by keeping your mouths shut. Not in the 21st century. Because you know and I know that every time you turn on that TV, American poison comes flowing through it. Every time you turn on a radio, American poison comes through it. It's precisely because everything is constantly beating against you. Billboards, advertisements, newspapers, TV, radio, music, magazines, everything, nonstop, constantly, over and over and over and over, that you must say what needs to be said. And your first reaction cannot be, is somebody's feelings going to be hurt? That can't even enter into your thinking. How somebody feels about the truth does not become the barometer of whether you say it or not. If our blessed Lord would have run his life like that, we wouldn't have been redeemed. Everything our Lord said was offensive to somebody. And generally, everybody who heard it. Remember when he, the Pharisees came up to him. Pharisees came up to him and said, you know, hey, we're the sons of Abraham. And he said, your father is the devil because you do your father's will. Well, they were all so disgusted and offended at that, that story ends with the, with the sentence, and from that moment they went off and plotted how to kill him. You don't get to sit around as Catholics and weigh whether what you should say is the truth or not, is, should be said or not. It's not an option. It's not an option. And for folks who are young, you guys have a heck of a lot more stuff to have to say. People who are older who are Catholics, you know, kind of settled in our ways. You guys are the front. You're the front where the war is going on. It's your friends who are thinking, ah, sex with anyone is fine, and all that stuff. You got to say something. You've got to say, no, that's wrong. But you also have to be able to say why it's wrong. You have to know church teaching. Not just what the church teaches, but why the church teaches it. You have to know this stuff. You have to spend time doing this. You can't just say to your adult child, well, you shouldn't be shacking up with her. That's not moral. The church says no. For somebody who doesn't believe or understand what the church teaches about that, that it convinces, them, convinces them not at all. You have to be able to explain why. You have to be able to explain to people why the RH law, makes me sick to say that, why the RH law is bad. Because contraception leads to abortion. Because contraception leads to no-fault divorce. Because families will be shattered. You know, when contraception became legal in the United States back in the 1960s, 
people who knew that this would happen didn't have any historical proof to point to. You now do. You get to say to your brother and sister Filipinos, you get to say, look at America. One out of every three children gets aborted. One out of every two marriages ends in divorce. Nearly one out of every two children has no father. Do you want our country to become like that? Because that's what's going to happen. And I'm telling you, as sure as I'm standing here, that is exactly what will happen to the Philippines. You have to fight it. And you're not going to fight it by keeping your mouth shut. You're going to fight it by standing up and saying what the case is. Now, the Philippines is sitting right here on a sword. Right now, today, is sitting right here on a sword. And which way you fall on that sword is totally up to the church. Because the church is the majority here in the country. Even the bad ones. You still get to go talk to them. You're still related to them. They're still your family members. They're still your students. They're still your co-workers. And you're sitting right here on a sword. And you're going to tip one way or the other. The people who pushed for RH are not like, oh, that's it, we're done now. They want no-fault divorce. They want abortion. There are huge outside of the Philippine interests with the United Nations and the United States and Planned Parenthood and Maria Stopes and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation who want abortion legal in this country. And they are not going to stop until they get it. You must raise your voices and you must point to the horror that the United States has become. And the only way you're going to do this is to get involved. You have to stop doing whatever it is that you think is fun, not immoral, just fun, and realize the perilous hour that your nation and your people have arrived at. That means you, you, need to change and say, wow, 30 years ago, I could go golf on weekends or go play this game or go do that. I can't do that anymore because the life of my country is threatened. Now I have to become involved. I have to get rid of my hobbies. I have to stop doing this thing that I like and I have to stick my face in this stuff and I have to get research. I have to know enough so I can start responding to blogs. If I don't have a computer, I need to get one. If I've got one and I don't know how to use it, I've got to find out how to use it. I've got to get involved in every possible way I can. I've got to get to Mass as frequently as I can because above all, the most important thing is that I save my soul. And in the process of saving my soul out of love for my neighbor, to try to help save my country, I will save my soul and others as well. There is no other Catholic way to look at this. Politics is just the tip of the iceberg. It must be addressed. You must do whatever needs to be done. You must tell people they cannot vote for evil candidates and they cannot vote for evil laws. But as a Catholic, you have to be able to tell them why it's evil and what will happen if they do. Your country is ready to go into oblivion, moral oblivion, and only you can stop it. There is no turning America back. America is done. It's done. Probably this summer, same-sex marriage will be legal in the United States. It already is in nine states and the District of Columbia. So 20% of the states, it already is. Since 1973, we have killed 56 million, 56 million of our own citizens. Our economy is teetering and tottering because that many people out of the economy is causing it to crash. And the answer on the part of the people who voted for the baby killing is to just take more taxes from the people who are left. 
do not let your country go this way. You must fight this, and in order to fight it, you must change. You must go enlist the help of other people. Go find people who aren't sure about RH or whatever you need to do. Go do something. Wake up and do something. Change everything about how you live. Become saints and save your nation. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And for the intentions of our Holy Father, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Sacred Heart of Jesus, Immaculate Heart of Mary, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God love you all.